working class and to show the establishment what the working class is really capable of in the uh, in the 80s with the, with the coal miners. Um, to me, he's a, he's a real, he's a true working class hero. Um, so I introduce you, Mr. Arthur Spargill. Members, first of all, let me say that I'm very proud to be here supporting Shangara in this election. And I think on the abolition of capitalism and the establishment of socialism. Now, any political party that deviates from that and says, well, we support another party that takes a different view ought to consider their position. Because if they say, well, we think the Green Party ought to be supported, well, they ought to be in the Green Party. If they say, well, we ought to be in, say, some other organization that's done it, well, they ought to go and join it. The question is, look at our constitution. And I challenge anyone to defy the logic that's in that constitution, which was put together not by somebody down and saying that's what it is. It took months and months of consultation involving hundreds and hundreds of people to produce our constitution. And that constitution cannot really be challenged by anybody who calls themselves a socialist. It's a Marxist philosophy, of course it is. And I'm sick and tired of listening to politicians duck the question, are you a Marxist? Well, I, I, I support certain things, I do certain things. What's wrong with supporting Marx? One of the greatest revolutionary minds uh, of any century. And of course, he understood it. By the way, do you, do you know that uh, Marx had a lot of views on practically every event that was likely to come along? And I remember some of my tutors um, including Harry Pollitt, Willie Gallagher, explaining to me that uh, the one thing that you must never do is compromise in order to advance the movement at the expense of principle. Now, I've been involved both nationally and internationally for most of my adult life, since the age of 15. I have been involved in one or two strikes that are publicly known. I've been arrested six times. I've always been innocent. I struggled for my class. But in doing that, I also understood the words that Polly was saying to me and what Gallica was saying to me. Because there was this fierce debate about what you do in a situation where there are arguments, should we support this or should we support that? Well, I don't understand how anyone can possibly be a member of a political organization <coughs> and at the same time support another one. It doesn't make sense. Think about it. If people are prepared to support anyone of any of the parties in this election, this is what you would be supporting. First of all, as uh, has been explained by John, the European Union hasn't gone away. The Tories never wanted it to go away. They wanted it. And of course the ruling class wanted it. It was the Americans who proposed it. It was Marshall and Truman who advocated this organization. And alongside it, NATO was one of the, the children of the European Union or the European Economic Community. But look what you will do if you vote for any one of those parties who support and still support 
links with the European Union. Are you prepared to do that? One, you will be supporting a political party that wants to accept the four freedoms, so-called, by the European Union. The first one is the free movement of labour. Free movement of labour? Nothing of the sort. And there's a fundamental difference between migrant labour and immigrant. We in this country have always, in the working class movement, welcomed immigrant, refugees, asylum seekers. And throughout the 1950 period to certainly the to period of 2004, the number of people coming into our country was less than the number of people going out. How can anyone argue that that's wrong? Right. We should protect every single one of them, whether they come from India, Pakistan, West Indies, or any one of the colonies which we exploited both its resources and its people. But the annual income of people was 250,000 in round figures a year. The number of people going out of Britain in that same period was 350,000. Now my maths are my weakest subject. But I reckon that 350,000 is more than 250,000. So in other words, there's 100,000 that should result in the population of Britain going down. And in fact it was. In 2000, the population of Britain was 69 million. Today, 59 million, my apologies. Today, it's 67 million. So where the hell did the 8 million come from? They didn't just appear out of thin air. The reason for the increase in population is because of migrant labor from the European Union. It is only since the Lisbon Treaty that the four freedoms, their description, our ours, really came home and outlined what the reality was. First of all, it means that people can just move from one nation into another. And Marx said, it's a dangerous thing to have movement of labour. He was talking about the Irish, by the way, at a time when they were part and parcel of the United Kingdom. But he warned of the conflict in moving forcibly labour as a result of starvation from Ireland in to England. He said it does two things. If you don't believe me, check it. Read some of Marx. He said it creates tension between those who have come in and those who are already there because there's only so many jobs. Secondly, the resources are available are being stretched in that situation. And who benefits? The ruling class. And so we've got to be extremely careful how we deal with that situation. Secondly, if people support any one of the political parties, any one of them, they'll also be supporting what's called the free movement of capital. And of course, it's one of them that's very rarely referred to. But there's nothing to stop. Company after company, and we've had one only this week, moving their entire works abroad. With the result that 100 to 200 people lose their jobs. You've had it in Birmingham. You see what's happened. It used to be the heart of the car manufacturer. We produce more cars than anybody in the world, pro rata to the size of our nation. Look at the situation now. How many British cars produced by British people do we have? 
And that's not just a nationalist thing. It's a reality economic thing. At the time prior to joining the European common market, 80% of our economy was based on our natural resources and our ability to produce. Today, our economy has only got in manufacturing 10%. Now, it doesn't need a brilliant mind or a top economist to work out that if you've got a situation where 80% of what you produce is produced here to make you better off, to mean that you've got real wealth compared with 10% of the wealth that we produce today. Think about it. If the city of London were to move all its institutions abroad, we've got nothing. Because we're living on an exchange of money. And they do it at a vast profit. We've seen time and time again, our cars have been taken over, not just the railways that John talked about, but they're owned by the Germans, or the French, or the Spanish, or the Italians, under their marks. They, they have taken over what was produced here by British companies with British workers. And as a result, our unemployment, in real terms, is around four and a half to five million. But of course, we've seen that there are certain political parties that still say, well, we'll accept reluctantly the referendum. Well, it's good of them, isn't it, to accept the will of the people. But what we'd like to do is to continue with the single market. Well, let me explain what the single market is. The single market is the birth child of the customs union. And the customs union, not often referred to, means that you're not allowed to impose import controls if you're threatened with the dumping of goods produced by slave labor or by child labor. Oh, I'm sorry, not for me. I don't want to say, well, the goods in that shop are pretty cheap because they're being produced by children aged seven whether it's the Indies, or whether it's uh, Southeast Asia, or whether it's uh, in the Pacific. It doesn't matter. If they're being produced in those conditions, don't tell me that child or slave labor equals fair competition. It doesn't. And we should all be willing to stand up and be counted on that issue. But that's the single market. Both the Labour Party and the Tory Party from 1945 to the 1970s, imposed import controls. They're as simple to understand as ABC. If someone comes along and says, we support our steel industry abroad, could be anywhere, could be Germany, and we give them a subsidy for, the, for just an example. We give them each year 500,000 pounds so they can make their steel cheaper. Well, in this country, people will go for the cheap steel. It's coming in. The only answer to that is put an import control. In other words, if our steel is cheaper than theirs, but for the subsidy of the slave labor or child labor, <coughs> what you do is you put an import control and you make sure that if they're bringing that type of produce in, they've got to pay an import control, which makes it more expensive. That stops it. And that preserved our steel industry. It preserved our car industry. It preserved our coal industry. It preserved all our basic other industries, such as cotton, textiles, with millions of people in work, generating real wealth. All of that is no longer possible because of the customs union. And we still subscribe to it because for two years, because of this government's inability to understand, and the opposition's inability to understand, we should have just walked away from the European Union once the referendum result had been declared. 
and we could have done a letter saying, Dear sir, we are now leaving the European Union as of from today. Yours faithfully. End of story. We could do that in international law under Article 50, subsection 1. But it wasn't done. They went for the second thing, to negotiate with markets. Absolute nonsense. And of course, flying in the face of all those examples throughout the world that we've seen where our goods and services have been protected. I didn't invent the concept of protecting industries or protecting our own goods and services. They did that in India a long time before I was here. They invented the phrase, homespun. And it's right, isn't it? Would it have been right for those people in India to continue to accept that they had to use, if they could afford it, the silk produced in Britain, or the cotton produced in Britain, or the salt produced in Britain, when they've got an abundance of it there? Of course not. And they can produce some of the best in the world. So it makes common sense to use your own natural resources. And yet still, in spite of all the evidence, these political parties want part and parcel of a single market. And by the way, you talk about misleading. Misleading is a, a calm word. It's a downright lie, actually, what they're telling you. For example, I heard a politician the other night say that uh, in Scotland, you know, we'd be better off if we were out on our own. Do you realise that 40% of our manufacture, you know, is in trade with the European Union? Nobody in the debate had the intelligence to point out that of that 40%, nearly 30% is with England, not the European Union. But an even better example is this. Every single year, trade from the United Kingdom with the European Union leaves us with a deficit of approximately 80 billion. Trade with the rest of the world, whether it be America, Canada, India, Pakistan, wherever it may be, or China, leaves us in surplus by 40 billion. Now, I ask you, which one would you go for? The one that produces a surplus or the one that produces a deficit? It doesn't need a high degree of economic intelligence to work that one out. But that's the reality of what the European Union does. But what's going to happen if people take a, an alternative position and say we ought to uh, look at the um, alternative? We ought to consider voting for somebody else. Well, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? First of all, let me tell you what you'll be voting for. If you voted for any one of the other political parties, and you'll notice I'm not suggesting any other party. I'm, the na I'm naming them all. First of all, and it includes the Green Party, they're all in favour of a mixed economy. Now, if there's a person who calls themselves a socialist or a communist or a Marxist that supports a mixed economy, then it's time to re-examine their position. A mixed economy is a capitalist system. It means private enterprise, the very thing that John talked about. That's why our industries, such as rail, are now owned, ironically, by nationalised industries in other countries. So if nationalisation doesn't work, why the hell are we selling it to nationalised industries? The best example is the Euro, the Eurostar. The Eurostar was built with national money, taxpayers' money, in France, Belgium and Britain. And when it started to make a massive profit, Britain immediately privatised it. So now the only two nations that make anything from the Eurostar are in Belgium and in France. And as John has explained, even now, 
their right-wing governments are considering the position about how they can privatise it. I'll give you another explanation as well. Um, I've seen in action what happens when people decide to collaborate with other parties. Um, in my lifetime, I've known a lot about France. First of all, in a personal sense, I knew a, a young woman I was engaged to at the age of 18. But apart from that, I learned quite a lot about the French system. And I saw at first hand the impact and the effect of Euro communism. Euro communism was the death knell of communism throughout Europe. The communist parties in Italy and France were the largest political parties anywhere in Europe. Massive numbers, over a million members in Italy. In France, they used to produce a vote of over 30 to 35 percent. And yet, in 1985, what did they do? They joined <laughs> together in a coalition with the socialists under Mitterrand. And the first thing Mitterrand did was to appoint ministers from the Communist Party whose job it was to close down industries like coal and steel and others which were major industries in France. That's the price of cooperation with political parties who don't share your perspective or political view. Let's look at what the other parties are pr producing. Do you agree with it or disagree? For example, National Health Service. We say it needs 25 billion now. No other party says that. No. We said that that 25 billion should be protected each year by the rate of inflation so that it maintains its value. And that we should have sufficient doctors and nurses and health workers staff so that we are in a position to give everybody the opportunity to have health care either in a hospital or at home or wherever at the time of need, upon demand and completely free of charge. We should have dentistry, completely free of charge. Free of charge in this sense that we've already paid for it. We pay for it every day, every week, every year. In our taxes, in our pr produce, whatever we do, we, we, we pay for it. We accepted an iniquitous tax system called value-added <coughs> tax. Now, value-added tax is a European tax. It's far more damaging to the working class than it is to the ruling class. It's a ruling class uh, tax haven. At every stage of production, 20%, 20%, 20%. So that if we were making something in this room, the chair and me, she passed me that cup, 20%. I pass it to John, another 20% on that, and so on and so forth. Think about that in comparison with a straightforward income tax. Well, there is a, a solution, but you know, it's got a problem. It's called a socialist Marxist solution. In this country, we could take the 10% of the population who own 90% of the wealth. And we could put a 20% tax straight on it 20%, do you know what it would bring? It would bring in, in the first year, 800 billion pounds. Who said that? John MacDonald. He said it after I said it, but that's by the way. Incidentally, he used to work for me in the National Union of Mine Workers. But he was right on that. But I've noticed it's absent from the manifesto I can't find it in their manifesto or anybody else's. So why should they have three trillion in the pen three trillion in the pension fund? And when we suggested that we could take from that three trillion, in addition to what I've just said about the top ten percent, 
we could take from that pension fund, which is massive, we could take up to a trillion, and we could have everything paid for in our manifesto within a year. Andrew O'Neill was flummoxed. He says, are you seriously suggesting that you take money from a pension fund? And our representative says, yes, you've been bloody well taking it from our pension fund for years. You've taken 10 billion from the Mine Workers Pension Scheme. Or if we can take it from our scheme, we can take it from theirs. In other words, we can begin to practice what we preach. Education. Well, I've looked at education from the other people's point of view who are standing in this election. Compare Shangara's position to theirs. First of all, Shangara wants a publicly owned health service free of charge. He wants no private medicine. All of us do. Education, we want to see an end to private education. It's called public schools. And by the way, we're, in, we're not in favour of faith schools either. They've caused more that division than anything in the world. I said, if anyone can explain to me why it's possible for people from every religion, whether it be Muslim, Hindu, Christian, uh, Thai, whatever you want to call it, Buddhism, they can all go to Oxford or Cambridge or Leeds University or Birmingham University and study together. Well, if they can study together there, why the hell can't they study together both from the moment they're born? And stop recognising differences and recognise instead the compatibility between us, irrespective of our ethnic background. I could say, well, I want an Irish school because my great-grandfather came from Ireland. It's a thought, by the way. I <laughs> by the way, they've got a funny, funny system of electing their T-shirt. That's the Prime Minister. 65% of the members voted for his opponent, and he wins it. So, you know, democracy is relative. <laughs> but in this country, why is it that every political party are supporting a private education policy? Oh, yes, I know one party... I'm not going to start naming it, you know it. What they're going to do is they're going to put VAT on private education. Well, that's a double whammy for me, because first of all, I hate private education, and secondly, I detest VAT. Both of them supported by the European Union. Both of them ought to be opposed by anyone who calls themselves a socialist or a Marxist. Think about it. Giving a position of Eton or Harrow or Westminster public schools where all the tops went, the majority of them in Parliament, they all talk very nicely, you see, can hardly understand them. But VAT, that's all they'll get. They'll continue to spend what they get in the monies that John described, not just over 200,000. Some of them are getting four million a year. Quite a nice nest egg. Well, at four million a year, they ought to be paying an income tax, in my view, of at least 80%. I wish I was on that amount, and I'm sure that you do as well. But VAT doesn't square with the circle that we want. We want to end private education. Because it means that some children get benefit for only a small number, and it's the elite who will run either the legal system, the financial system, or indeed the domestic set arrangements in terms of uh, the superstores that we've got. Many of them, of course, of course, controlled through the United States of America as well. And that's not the European Union. So why on earth isn't there a policy coming forward to say we want an education policy that does away with private education? Now, if he did that, and every child was given the opportunity to be compared with their, their peers, so that we all get the same standard of education, 
That's the way to go forward, not backward, and put people who are not able to pay into a second category. Thirdly, look at housing. Well, the political parties who put forward policies of building on different sites, and uh, some of them have said we're going to build a billion uh, new council or uh, affordable homes. What's affordable? Why don't we just simply say what the Socialist Labour Party says? And it's Shangara's policy, by the way. As our candidate, we said produce a million homes, council houses, in a year. Don't tell me it can't be done. I remember as a child seeing half a village erected in months. And that was with an old-fashioned type prefabrication. You can, you can build housing on a fabricated basis. Yes, it's not, it's not a stately home, but it's a very good home. And you can resolve the housing problem literally within one year. Why don't they do it? I'll tell you why. Because it means that housing would become cheap because it would be available. And people would no longer have to pay monstrosities of rents. In other words, they would be in a sensible society. But no other political party, apart from ours, puts that forward. Pensions. The triple lock. Well, that's one policy that is very clear cut. But why is it that it's stuck on just 2.5%? I'll tell you why. The governments of both Labour and Tory introduced a new taxation system and a new inflation system at the same time. It was always called the Retail Price Index. You've all heard of it. Well, they brought in a new one called the Consumer Prices Index. Is it different words, or does it have a different effect? The answer is the second. It means that the calculation reduces dramatically the amount that you're able to draw as your pension after a lifetime working in any industry. And that's why these firms are saying, unless you accept CPI in your pension scheme, then we're going to have to close you down. In other words, they're blackmailing people, and yet nobody is saying that the triple lock ought to contain the RPI, or 5% as it used to do. And again, that's not uh, the sort of socialist policy that I want. What about Trident? <laughs> now, I always thought there was political parties in this country that were against Trident and against the nuclear uh, weaponry and against the arms race. And yet, they're fluffing around with it. Do you know how much it's going to cost? 250 billion. Because we're going to have four new submarines. They're going to do what? There's only going to be one out of water at a time. By the way, they've got a nuclear weapon 28 miles away from Britain, 28 miles away in France in NATO. And they're talking about, would you press the button first? Well, it doesn't bloody well matter, does it? <laughs> the sophistication we've got in technology now enables any country, and that includes the United States, Russia, it includes Pakistan, India, China, Israel, all of these countries, including Britain, to be aware that there's a nuclear attack taking place three minutes before it actually occurs. Quite long enough to press the button if you're it, daft enough to, to retaliate, but you'll have the knowledge that you'll have three minutes longer life. Three minutes! It's crackers. I mean, it's, seriously, think about it. And, that, and then ask the question, what crackpot won't press a button first in the knowledge that in three minutes you've gone? Well, 
Think about it. It doesn't make sense in any description whatsoever. But 250 billion to replace that crackpot system that's not wanted by the people of this nation. And then, of course, you've got a few more things. I've dealt with the issue of uh, the European Union, but what about NATO? Where do we go on that? And where do we do? Where do we stand <coughs> on what's going to become a United uh, a European Union uh, armed force unit? Why why are we still arguing amongst the main political parties to remain within NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is supposed to be an organization that's uh, there to protect. To protect what? What the hell is it doing in the Ukraine? What? Why is it poking its bloody nose in the Ukraine? When, by the way, the area which Russia said belonged to them in the Crimea actually did. It was gifted to the Ukraine during the period when there was a Soviet Union by Khrushchev. Or was a Ukrainian. But immediately the Soviet Union ceased to exist. They've got every right to have back that that was part of Russia in any case. But one thing always escapes me when I listen to broadcasts and certainly to the presenters on television. Why is it no one mentions that the reason we've got a conflict in the Ukraine is because there was a coup d'etat supported by the United States and the CIA to overthrow a legitimately elected government and depose its president, because that's what happened. And yet everybody says, that's okay. What would happen if we suddenly said, right, we're going to march and overthrow the government in this country? They say, you can't do that. That's insurrection. But well, what's the difference? All over the world, you can see how these people operate. What do people think happened in Chile? It was the CIA intervention that overthrew Allende because it looked as though they were going to have on their doorstep another Cuba, another possibility of building a, a socialist concept. Even the concept of socialism terrified them because it's in direct opposition to all that they stand for. Now, on the bread and butter issues in this election, because Sangara is the lad that's putting it forward, and you've got a right to know there isn't one piece in this manifesto updated that we can't pay for. In fact, we've got a surplus. We've got more than enough to pay for that, for education, for health, for care for the elderly, for pensions, for unemployment to be a thing of the past, to begin to make our industries grow again, to see our fishing industry grow again. Incidentally, you know there are other people who have already left the European Union, don't you? Greenland, for example, left. By the way, that's a subsidiary of Denmark, but they allowed them to have a referendum. Do you know what they said in the European Union? And I, I don't imitate it, but there it says, we want you, you know, this is very serious for you, because if you do this, then we warn you. You will be bankrupt very quickly. You will have no trade. You will have no possibility for trading with the European Union. Nobody will want your produce or fish. Well, I saw an interview with the president of Greenland. It's only been on once. I can't get it back up on a catch-up. They asked him what the position was. He said, oh, it's fantastic. He says, we now can't produce enough. And our main customer is the European Union. <laughs> he says, we can produce all the fish we want, and nobody else can come and fish in our waters. Well, why isn't it the same for our country? If we were able to have our fishermen going out and bringing in our fish, it's sustainable because we keep out all of those 27 countries who 
got a freedom of right to come in. And others beside. Well, it's time it stopped. And so you take your choices and you decide what you're going to do. I'm going to finish by uh, explaining where our party stands. Our party was founded on a principle that you don't compromise your principles. If anybody advocates supporting another party, when it's a member of a another party, then they've got to examine their conscience. That doesn't mean you don't, you could certainly cast a vote. It's a matter for you. But the reality is, how can a political party justify its existence? Or a political organization justify its existence if it's advocating support for another? You've got the Greens saying, we'll have a coalition with Labour. You've got the SNP in Scotland saying, I will do, we'll do that as well. And in Wales, oh aye, yeah, absolutely in Wales, we'll join it. So why are they not already in it? If it's so good to join, why aren't they joining it? Or what is the reality, reality behind it? The concept behind it? See, I believe that James Connolly was absolutely right when he said that we want nothing to do with the Labour Representation Committee. If we do that, if we join like others are joining, and that included many political parties, like the Social Democratic Federation and the Independent Labour Party, he says we will lose all our identity, we will lose all our faith, we will lose everything that we've ever stood for. How right he was. If there was a real Marxist thinker in the 20th century that's relevant in the 21st century, it was James Connolly. So that when we go out to campaign for the vote, on the 8th, bearing in mind our candidate is the one that's putting forward the policy of Connolly and the policy of the Socialist Labour Party, which is the solution to our problems because it demands the abolition of capitalism and the establishment of socialism as a way of society. <laughs>